Um, <laughs> gosh, I'm trying to remember. It, it's been a long time, but um, being a musician, I, you know, I wanted to be a rock star, of course. Uh, and I also wanted to be an NBA player, which um, ironically, even at 6'4", I'm still not tall enough. Podcast Junkies, episode 57. Just a quick reminder that last week we spoke to Jason Cabasi of Walking Dead Cast, the number one podcast for Walking Dead fans. So if you haven't had a chance to check that out, please do so. Podcast Junkies is the podcaster's voice, aka stories from interesting podcasters around the podverse. And we love to engage, interact, connect, and have candid conversations with some of the interesting folks uh, behind the microphones of today's most popular podcasts. So today I speak to the real Brian of ProfitCast. Brian's been um, pretty well known in the entrepreneurial podcast circles. He started his podcast about a year ago, and he's he was on a journey to find out how folks can actually monetize their podcast. He's got a history in, in background and a background in radio, and you'll be able to tell from the quality of his magnificent voice. So I w- I've been following him for a while, and most recently he's had some interesting success uh, as the host of a couple of new podcasts, which we'll talk about during the show. And I think it's been an interesting journey for him. And I was, I was eager to talk to him about that. And I think it just goes to show you that everyone's path is going to be different. And we all need to think about why we're, we, for those of us that podcast, why we podcast, what the end goal is, um, when we think we've had enough, when we think we might be close to pod fading, and when we might be close to pod pivoting and trying something out new. And, and I think he, he left himself open for a wide range of possibilities. So I'm glad to see things have uh, worked out for him and he's turned a corner. So please enjoy my conversation with uh, Brian, a.k.a. The Real Brian. So The Real Brian of, I was going to say from a certain podcast, but I, there's too many to name and I'm sure we'll get into all of them. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us on Podcast Junkies. Oh, you are so welcome. Thanks for having me on, man. Appreciate it. So I, I think we have uh, several mutual friends, and I'm glad we got to finally meet in person at yeah. uh, Podcast Movement. Were you at the Were you at the first one? I was. Yes. Wait, how co- how come we didn't meet then? I don't know. Well, you know, I was kind of new to the to the group. Yeah, I'm going to call it the group. You know, um, the posse. I, the posse. Yeah. Yeah. The hood. I, I just kind of was in that area. Like I'm, I'm starting to get to know some people. Um, there were a few podcasters I knew. I, I actually knew Addie who's one of our mutual friends. Yep. Um, and I had met her for the first time at the first podcast movement, but I didn't really know that many people. And I think that's changed dramatically in, in, in the yeah. year since. Yeah. I have a tendency to, uh, to, to love making friends. So <laughs> I got to get out and you know, build some friendships, have some fun. It's been great. Are you as uh, extroverted in real life as you are, as you sound on the podcasts? Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> See, here's the problem. <laughs> I was, uh, uh, I don't know if you heard, but I was at uh, a Dragon Con. Yeah, I heard you mention it on one of your shows. Yeah, so so for one of, you know, for the nerds out there, um, it's, you know, it's a convention, like a Comic Con, and I got a chance to finally meet my other two co-hosts who I had worked with for two years and never met in person, which is really weird. Um, but I got to meet them and then I got to meet some of our listeners. And I mean, the entire now, now let me just explain this, that my two co-hosts are extremely introverted and I'm like, Woo, let's go crazy. We're going to have some. Now, I'm not a drinker, though, but I'm like, I love getting out and just having a great time staying up, you know, being with people all day long. Totally fuels me. By the end of the day, they're giving me this look. And I'm like, you need some alone time, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's it's the differences. But uh, yeah, I love being around people. In fact, you know, I work obviously in the home studio kind of thing. And uh, I don't I don't see people as much as I'd like to. And, and I definitely my tank has been empty since since the con. And so were you at uh, the Dragon Con with um, because of the the uh, Arrow Squad podcast? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. And how, had you been to Dragon Con before? No, I had no idea what to expect. I heard that's pretty bananas. It's it's awesome, actually. Um, 
it's actually not as nerdy as I thought it was going to be. And granted, I'm a nerd, but I mean, you know, there there are some levels of nerd out there. And uh, I I heard it was kind of the nerdiest of the nerdiest of the nerdiest. And uh, it wasn't as bad as people were, were making it out to be. It was actually a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Because there's Dragon Con and then there's Comic Con yeah. in San Diego. Have you been to that one? I've not been to the San Diego Comic Con. Um, I have been to, you know, another Comic Con. Although I got to say this. I think San Diego, from what I understand, is quite the spectacle. But the thing that I liked about Dragon Con is that it's fan run versus corporate run. So it uh, really is more for you going, having a good time. The actors do not get paid to go to Dragon Con. So they're there because they want to be. Um, there's a lot less boundaries around the actors. So it really is a lot more fun from what I've heard. Um, and from the Comic Con I went to and then some of the other stuff, it's just it's very corporate. It's all about money. Which uh, you know I get it, but but I want to hang out. I want to have fun. I want to I want to meet the actors on a natural basis. So it's like profit con. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so do we need to do that now? <laughs> um, you, you could start. You could <clears throat> you could start a, a podcast about monetizing your uh, fanboy. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Why don't we just? I'll just do an episode on it and say, hey, we're going to have a um, a podcast. I mean, a conference for podcast how would you how would you do that podcast <laughs> movements for the podcasters too so you know they do a good job like you actually need one more podcast to host at this you point. know I, my schedule's not full yet <laughs> <laughs> wait strike that <laughs> are you yeah are you listening are you listening folks <laughs> brian has plenty of bandwidth <laughs> you're right yeah I, well let me say this i have a full schedule but i'm not busy and thanks to uh, John Dumas's little coaching that he kind of talked to me about the, here's how you batch. And, and he gave yeah. me a great example on what he does and how he does it. Very, very one-on-one -on -one example. And I went, wow, I had no idea. <laughs> like I've heard about batching a lot, but I didn't understand it. And when I implemented it, oh, wow. So as a result, I have bandwidth now. <laughs> thanks to that. Well, it's funny because I heard you mention it in one of your shows that you were, you were saying that you weren't um, big into the coaching itself and, and big into all these like productivity hacks and, and uh, putting limits in terms of your calendar. Because there's people, I'm sure you've seen them, they actually plan out their whole day and their whole week. And this is when I'm going to lunch and this is when I'm taking a break. And I think they need that sort of structure. Mm -hmm. And I think on a couple of your episodes, as you were thinking about this, you were saying, well, that's not me. So I'm not sure if that approach is going to work. Yeah. yeah, I'm definitely more of a, a free spirit. Um, I like flexibility in my day, but at the same time, you know, I need to get stuff done too. So kind of finding that balance, I think was, was actually very difficult for me because I know I needed to create a structure that would help me to stay focused. And I'll, well, I guess this not even necessarily help me stay focused. Cause that's not necessarily my problem. I can sit down and work on a project and, you know, not lose interest, not get distracted. The problem I run into is it allows me to be focused. So instead of saying, okay, I've got five things vying for my attention right now by creating that schedule. It allowed me to say I can focus on one thing right now and not have to go to the second thing until this time. And by doing that, I have seriously gone from a 60 hour work week to down to about a 30 hour work week and getting probably four to six times more done in that 30 hours. It blows my mind. I didn't even know it was possible. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a huge productivity geek and um, I'm, I, I read all those hacks about how to get to inbox zero and how to do more with like Evernote yeah. and all this, all these Chrome plugins and stuff like that. So I've been a student of, of that movement for some time now, but I'm wondering for you, what, what, what had to change internally in your mind in order for you to make that shift um, and to, without losing that free spirit of yours? Oh gosh. Um, okay. So this is going to sound weird, but confidence was a big one. Because uh, I, okay. I didn't actually believe I could do it. And I didn't believe that I could turn or, or say no to people because I'm one of those people who just likes to say yes to everything. Um, so I didn't believe I could actually do it. And by having that confidence to say, no, you know what? In order for me to create value and to, and, and to basically do all my work with excellence and quality, I've got to do this no matter what. And I am going to have to say no to people at times. Um, and that was very hard for me to do because I like to, unfortunately, I'm a, I'm somewhat of a people pleaser and I'm trying to kind of get past that because that's not healthy. Um, so what I've been trying to do is tell people, you know, I can't, I, I wish I could, but I can't, or this is when I can meet with you and that's it. And um, there was a lot of fear people because people have told me in the past, you know, they're like, 
oh my gosh, you know, you're, you're so inflexible and, and, you know, who do you think you are? <laughs> and I'm like, it's not that it's just, I need to, I need to tell my schedule. I need to basically tell my day where to go instead of it telling me what to go or, or where to go and what to do. And by doing that, I think it's created some great boundaries around the proverbial, Hey, can you chat for five minutes? And I go, Oh sure. No problem. Give me five minutes and I'll, we'll chat for five minutes and it turns into an hour. Um, and I don't do that anymore. Do you find that as you, as you, you're in these circles, more of folks that are organized with their podcasts and that have their own shows and, and that are juggling multiple responsibilities, that those are the people that get it as opposed to folks who, let's say, do have more free time on their yes, hands? Absolutely. <laughs> Interestingly enough. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, because you you had a you had a um, when you were working at the radio station you had a I don't know if you'd call it a corporate job but I'm assuming you had some structure there. Yeah, well, when I did uh, actual terrestrial radio, yeah, there was that's different structure though because as a as an on air talent, you just come in for you know your hours, you do your shift, and then you go and you record voiceover work and do some other stuff, production and stuff like that, and then you leave. So it was it was structured, but it wasn't. Um, it was very different than what we're doing, you know, from that standpoint. Um, when I, I've been an entrepreneur most of my life. So I really comes down to, I, I've had to kind of create my own schedule. And, and what I've noticed is that, yes, just like you said, the people that I've learned from are those who have actually been very successful with their business, that they've created that schedule and that calendar that works for them and their business and allows them to. So for example, I did an episode um, that said, if you're busy, your podcast is going to fail. And, you know, most of the time when I say, Hey, how are you? The response I get from most people is busy. And I did a study on this that, um, with John Lee Dumas, for example, I studied him a little bit and I studied his schedule and then I studied some other people as well. And I realized that those guys are not busy. They have a very, oh, Michael Hyatt was another one I studied. Um, they have a very full schedule. They are hard workers. They have a lot going on, but they're not busy people. And that concept kind of blew my mind in a way that I really couldn't wrap my head around for quite a while until I studied it more and more and more and realized, oh, I get it. Like they're telling their, their stuff where to go. They're telling how much time they're going to give. They set boundaries like at 5 p.m. I'm done. It's family time or friend time or whatever. And I'm not working during that time and I'm not available during that time. And um, it was kind of a new concept to me because everything I've learned is be available regardless. And when, when you were, so do you consider the time you were at the radio station as entrepreneur uh, focused? Uh, terrestrial? No. But when I sort of ran and, and was program director for some of the uh, internet stations, that was more entrepreneurial. Yeah. And what was, so what was your first, first job in terrestrial radio? Uh, let's see my first, well, the first paid gig, I guess let's call it that. Um, I worked part-time for uh, a local station and I was an on-air host and a producer for basically, I didn't produce shows necessarily because when you're, when you're live, you're not producing anything. You're just doing your thing. Um, which is very different obviously than what the podcast is you, you record and then you produce. But when you're on a live show, the programming is already done in advance and you just jump in between songs and talk and then you're done, you leave. Um, but I also did production for commercials and, um, station IDs and that kind of thing. And who was, how, how does, how does one decide that they want to get into radio? And is it just something that you were a fan of since you were a little yeah, kid? Yeah, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> gosh, I'm trying to remember. It, it's been a long time, but, um, being a musician, I, you know, I wanted to be a rock star, of course. Uh, and I also wanted to be an NBA player, which, um, ironically, even at six, four, I'm still not tall enough. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I still play basketball. I still enjoy it, but I was never that good. So, um, yeah, getting into radio was kind of one of those things I discovered. Uh, I want to say it was back in the days of, of Wolfman Jack. And I think oh, yeah. it was towards the end of his life, actually, that, um, uh, you know, I'd heard about him. Um, my, my parents had showed me the movie American Graffiti. If you remember that movie from, yeah, oh, yeah. it's just a classic. Um, and, you know, he was on there and I was like, dude, this guy's awesome. I want to be a DJ like him, you know, and it was pretty cool. And I used to listen to radio a lot back. Well, I mean, I guess it was ending its heyday at the time. Um, but yeah, I wanted to be a, a radio DJ. I loved music. I loved sharing music with people. Um, I loved playing it for people probably more than they enjoyed hearing it, but Hey, you know, 
And so I wanted to, uh, I wanted to do that. And I got into basically what, what I did is we, we kind of messed around, um, when I was in, I want to say high school, even late middle school, early high school, um, we'd have friends over and be like, let's just create a little radio studio in my bedroom and let's just record a radio station. <laughs> it was the most random thing. And people are like, you do that for fun? I'm like, yeah, it's a blast. And everybody had a great time. I mean, we, we still have memories of those days and I still actually have the cassette tapes of those recordings somewhere. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where it all started. And then I got to meet a DJ at one of the local stations when I was in high school and he let me shadow him for a while and, um, and do kind of some stuff with their studios, which led me to start my high school radio station. Um, and it was an internal station. It wasn't an actual on air broadcast, but you know, we got to use the, the main speaker system and kind of use their whole, their whole setup and, and create something that we'd, we'd broadcast in the mornings and during lunchtime and, um, afternoons and that kind of thing too. And that's kind of where the whole thing started. It was just a huge passion. Um, I, I, I wanted to be a radio DJ where I could play music for people and then eventually own a radio station. And, uh, I got very close to that dream and then radio started to kind of die off, uh, you know, giving way to digital media. So when you say you got really close, um, uh, does that mean that you didn't feel like you got, or you got in at, at, at a high point? No, I, I got in on the, uh, the downside, unfortunately, like I was, I was getting ready to start a radio station and I was going to own it and I was going to do some stuff. And, um, you know, at the time I was told, Oh, radio is going to explode, but, but it's going to be internet radio. It's not going to be, you know, terrestrial terrestrials on its way out, um, get into digital online radio. And, uh, I got into it, you know, it was like, it's coming, it's coming. And then within two years later, it's dying. I went, Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> and that's when podcasting really I mean, podcasting had been around, um, but it was really starting to take off. That's when Spotify was uh, just released in the U.S. And um, Pandora was getting big and everyone's like, you know, we don't listen to radio anymore. We don't want to wait around for our favorite song. We want it right now. And so that's when the era of radio started to die. It's not dead, but it's, you know, it started. When you had your bedroom radio station, were you actually broadcasting or were you just recording within the room? Just recording on a cassette tape. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we'd play it for people. What were your call letters? <laughs> oh, man. You had to ask that one. Um, <laughs> keep in mind, we were high schoolers. Okay. Um, it was WPME. So if you uh, try to say it, it's Whip Me Radio. <laughs> <laughs> we, were, we were stupid, you know? It's fun. That's what, kids, that's what kids are supposed to do at that age. Totally, man. And we had the whip crack and, you know. Oh, really? Was, oh, you know, it was, it was so bad. Did you play, awesome. did you play any Devo? Totally. <laughs> yeah. You got to whip it. Absolutely. Whip it good. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, when you went over to high school, I think you mentioned, I think on the, at the beginning of the podcasters paradise uh, podcast, when you started the high school uh, radio station that you, you, you mentioned something that I thought was interesting. It was sort of a way for you to keep the peace with the students. Yeah. Did I hear that correctly? Yeah, that's correct. And how, how did you do that with the radio station? Uh, well, it, it was a weird thing because, um, you know, a typical high school, there's going to be fights. There's going to be, um, you know, people having bad days, teachers having bad days, you know, the stuff that goes on in, in life. Um, but I don't know. I just had this, I had actually kind of a weird feeling. Uh, and I'm really surprised that I can remember this right now, but <laughs> it's been a while. Um, but I had this weird feeling where I was like, you know, I really believe that doing something like a radio station where we can play music for people, take requests, um, you know, do something that is going to encourage everyone in the school in a way that I would think would, you know, we're going to say things that's encouraging. We're going to play music that people are going to like. It's going to allow people to get their days started with a better attitude. Um, and with that, I would assume teachers will be happier. I would assume students will be happier. And I would assume that in general, it's going to bring the school together through a common medium. That was my idea. That was my pitch. Um, and actually, when I went out uh, and did this, there was an assistant principal that was adamant about destroying me. She had no desire for this. She was so against it. It was like, it was like war was declared. Wow. Um, but the principal herself loved it, thought it was phenomenal and said, we're doing this regardless. And um, so we did it. And as a result, we did see that, um, like we were told later by some of the, the, the school leadership that fights were down statistically. Everybody's attitudes were better. Teachers were happier. Students were happier. They said it literally started when you started this radio station. And I was like, Wow. <laughs> So I don't know, it's kind of a feeling, but it also was proven to happen. Why do you think uh, uh, that, that 
Was, it was the principal or the assistant principal that was against you? Assistant. Out of all the things to be against <laughs> in terms of like <laughs> supporting students, doing something productive and, and keeping themselves out of trouble and, and ideally keeping other students out of trouble. If you had to, it's hard to go back in, in time, I know, but if you had to think about why he or she would possibly be against you doing this, can you think of why? I have no idea specifically to this day. Um, she was a very bitter person though, unfortunately. So something in her life was hurting her, whatever it was. I, I don't know. She, she had obviously a deep pain and, and that was how she took it out on people. I don't know what it was. And I don't, but that, that's what I think it was. I don't think it's necessarily that she didn't like the idea. I just think it was her way of keeping control and dealing with whatever she was going on in her own life. Yeah. I'm getting the visualization of, uh, Edward Rooney, the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> very similar. Oh my gosh. Except not, not that funny because Edward Rooney at least had some, you know, it was pretty funny. <laughs> and if anyone listening doesn't get that reference, then please, please, yeah. please go watch First Bueller's Day Off. <laughs> Nine times. <laughs> exactly. Anyone? Anyone? Yeah. He's a righteous dude. So, uh, do you want to give a shout out to your high school? Nah. <laughs> That's been a while ago now. <laughs> Was there any part of you that did that to be more popular? Oh, yeah. Totally. Yeah. I was, um, well, you, you know, high school dynamics, right? Oh yeah. Well, it, yeah. I, I, mine, mine were a bit different. I went to an all boys Catholic high school. Ah, okay. Yeah. That would definitely be a different scenario. Yeah. It was, um, well, so here was the problem. I had to get glasses and braces at the exact same time, which, you know, automatically makes you somebody to get made fun of. In high school. It's just, well, I was actually in middle school. Okay. But, um, you know, I, you have that happen at the same time. I mean, you're a target. It's just the way it happens. Uh, I was definitely a nerd. I've always been a nerd, you know. Um, but at the time, so this is going to be something that's going to be shocking. I was an introvert back then. I was very shy. Um, and I didn't know how to really interact with people or relate to people at all. And I was a musician, obviously. So I related to musicians. And, of course, in middle school, it's band nerds. So that's just what it was. Um, and I didn't really, I mean, I played sports, but like I said, I wasn't good enough to be in on the team with those guys. Um, so for me, it was like, I tried to get into the group, but I wasn't, I wasn't cool enough, I guess. So when I did the, uh, the radio thing, part of me was like, yeah, dude, I want to, I want to pick up girls or, <laughs> you know, meet girls or <laughs> I didn't pick up girls. I couldn't drive. Right. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, that was definitely, definitely a motivation, but also it's just something I wanted to do as a passion. Um, and, and the interesting thing was, is as soon as I started that radio station, all of a sudden I became one of the most popular kids in school, just like instantly. And I was just like, really? So on one side, I'm like, this is really cool. And on the other side, I'm like, is, are we really that fickle? <laughs> it's what it is. Right. Uh, but what was cool is that because I had been made fun of so much, I knew what it felt like. So it sort of gave me a platform to be able to stand up for others that had been made fun of. Um, and, and kind of not like in a way that I would pick fights with like certain groups of, of people, but more of like, um, you know, really like this isn't cool. That's not how we treat people. And interestingly enough, that radio platform allowed me the opportunity to, uh, to actually stand up for people and not get, um, the backlash, like people actually back down, which was interesting. Do you, I'm just, a thought just crossed my mind. Do you think that, um, approach to, you know, not not putting up with that sort of thing, um, especially after you became more popular. And I'm I'm assuming you sort of had a little bit of influence and 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 were able to say to other folks, "Hey, that's not cool." In case you saw that behavior being directed mm -hmm. at others who were not as fortunate, um, I wonder if you still carry that through because I hear you um, when you talk about your show and you and you ask for feedback. I I, I know that you say, um, "Let's just keep it." Um, keep it clean or something like that, I think you said, or just keep it, uh, no, like, uh, keep it respectful say, or something like that. Yeah. I say it respectful and positive. Yeah. Or constructive. Yeah. So has that been like a mantra now that you've been, you sort of, uh, live your life by? Yeah. I've, uh, I've seen a lot of hate in my life. Um, I've, I've watched people tear other people down for no reason. Um, it's, it's bad. It's happened to me. You know, I've had people rip me apart because they, you know, assumed something that wasn't true or, you know, they, you know, people spread lies about everybody. It's what it is, right? It's, we're, we're addicted to gossip. We're addicted to negativity. 
And um, so I've been a recipient of it. I've seen others be a recipient of it. I've caused it to other people. I've hurt people because I've been stupid. So yeah, I've, I've seen, unfortunately, how, um, how that kind of hate um, or disrespect or whatever you want to call it has, has uh, really affected people around, my lo- you know, around me and my life and, and also myself too. And I've just gotten to the point that I'm like, you know, if we're really going to do anything in this life, if we're ever going to make a difference, if we're actually going to look back on our life when we're on our deathbed and say, I'm happy about my life, I made a difference, I know I helped somebody, we got to stop this crap. And, um, and so that's one of the things, cause you know, I've done podcasts and radio shows in the past where people just love to trash you, you know, there's haters out there. Um, and I'm just like, you know, come on, that's just, that's not cool. That's just not cool. We don't do that to people. And so, yeah, that's one of the biggest things that I said on ProfitCast is listen, I want your feedback and I want your honesty, but please keep it respectful, positive and constructive because if I need to learn something and if I need to correct something, you're not going to reach me by trashing me. But you will reach me if you're respectful and you're constructive and you mention something that I either messed up on or I need to fix or whatever. So that's kind of how I, yeah, that's my mantra. (laughs) The golden rule, right? It's true. But unfortunately, not a lot of us live by that. And I wish we did more. I'd like to think that uh, this whole idea of bullying is sort of being pulled out of the shadows. And it's almost um, to the point where, where, where we're now bully shaming, if you will, and calling out these folks who or these kids who are doing it and mm-hmm. making them feel like they're the ones who who should be singled out because what they're doing is not cool mm-hmm. and it's hard because i mean everyone remembers grade school and high school and i mean hazing and i mean i was tiny <laughs> in a mm-hmm. freshman year man i didn't hit my growth <laughs> i didn't hit my growth spurt until uh uh i think a, maybe sophomore year yeah. and, and thankfully my older brother was a year ahead of me so he sort of paved the way and he's like oh yeah you can't touch my little brother so <laughs> <laughs> nice nice so i didn't get shoved into any lockers i fit believe me i fit <laughs> oh no yeah uh, but it was it, yeah it's funny man i think uh i think kids don't have anything better to do man well <laughs> it's not just kids yeah i hate to say it i still see it yeah it's great it happens right? yeah i know it's just like really but yeah there's a lot of bullying i see still going on i mean even just thinking about like when you're out driving and, uh, you know, the road rage and that kind of thing that's still going on and people pushing, literally physically pushing people around with their cars. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh. Yeah, so, that's, yeah. That, uh, that's a whole different dynamic because people do things in cars that they wouldn't dream of doing if there was just the two of you standing in the street face to face. Yeah, or on the Internet. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. We say things on the Internet because we're not face to face. This passive aggressive behavior. Yeah. Well, we think we're safe. You know, we think, oh, well, I can say whatever I want because I'm never going to meet this person. And it's like I wouldn't necessarily assume that. <laughs> there's i gotta I'll, I'll try to look it up while we're on the call but there's a, a very interesting movie uh, uh, from spain uh pedro almodovar he produced it mm-hmm. and uh it's about the whole it's a, a series of like six or seven snippets and they're all about revenge and how like the horrible consequences it can have oh, yeah <laughs> and yeah. i just I, i've only seen half of it and the first three segments were like so crazy because it's like one person gets mad at the other person and then they do this one thing and then, then it leads into this horrible chain and you're just like, Oh no. <laughs> but it's, 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 it's like fantastic to watch, but it was like, wow, that's, that's you, the, the, people don't think about the consequences of their actions. No. Well, you're right. I think that's actually the best thing right there is like we, we react instead of think about it and then respond appropriately. And uh, yeah. Plus I always like to say, look in the mirror. You know, we all make mistakes, right? Of course. So to judge someone else is like, uh, well, it's going to come back to you somehow. Yeah. What is it? The, yeah. It's, uh, let he, who is without. <laughs> yeah. Without it. sin, cast the first stone. That's exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Don't be judged unless you want to be judged. Yeah. Those, those are uh, great things I live by. <laughs> so when did you start, uh, playing? What, what instrument do you play by the way? Piano. And uh, when did that start? I was six. Six? Is it, is yep. it running the family? Um, yeah, actually, some of it. Uh, I've got cousins who are extremely uh, musical. My grandma's musical. I mean, a lot of my family has musical tendencies. Some, you know, definitely more than others. Uh, but yeah. So who from your family would you say, if they did, inspired you to, to, to start playing or take lessons? Uh, I wouldn't say necessarily anyone inspired me to, um, start playing necessarily, or, or like my, my parents were like, Hey, 
let's go take piano lessons and go from there. And I actually had some fantastic piano teachers that were very inspiring, very good. Um, and actually my first piano teacher taught me a lot about listening by ear and improvising and stuff. So it was like, I learned classical, but I learned a lot of well-rounded stuff so that I wasn't just about the notes. And, um, as a result, I've been able to, you know, like I love movie soundtracks, so I can go and pick up a movie soundtrack and play it on the, you know, the piano, um, and just listen to it and play it. So it's been a lot of fun doing stuff like that, or I compose music. But, um, I think later, well, this goes back to the whole, you know, uh, the girl thing, right. You know, the wanted to be popular. I think in high school, it's like, dude, if I can play the piano, man, yeah, yeah. So, um, so that was one, one motivation and which actually did work. So I'll tell you that. Um, but on the other hand too, I think, you know, looking at it from a long-term perspective was, uh, one of my, uh, ancest, one of my ancestors was a, uh, uh, they were part of the, uh, gosh, like the movement that started country music. Wow. And so that was pretty cool. Although I don't like country music, so sorry, country lovers, um, <laughs> which I, I think is ironic. I'm like, oh, of all genres, we had to be famous for starting country. But, you know, they were musicians. They did really well. They had their own radio show as well. And so that was kind of an inspiration to, um, uh, this was a long time ago, but it was it was an inspiration to kind of say, hey, you know, this is something that does run in the family. It's something I can do. Um, and I really like to play music. And, and also just finally, like there was actually one pivotal moment um, and, and this was really weird, but it was one pivotal moment in my life where I wrote a, a, a I'm instrumental by the way. I don't, I don't write lyrics. So okay. I composed a piece of music just for piano and I played it one day. And it was interesting because, um, it was, uh, it was actually for my church in high school. I played it then, but there's a guy that I knew that had been going there, you know, and, and all that. And apparently he had brought his elderly mother to church first time or whatever. But um, I played that music and he came up to me, I don't know, a couple months later and he said, you know, his entire life, his mother just had this really hardened attitude, you know, and, and was just kind of, I don't know, just kind of a not, a, not a mean spirited person, but, you know, not an emotional person. And he had said he'd never seen his mom cry ever, just that kind of thing. Um, and he said that, that he saw her for the first time that day cry when I was playing that song. Wow. And then she died like two weeks later. <laughs> I was like, wow. So, I mean, it was that moment that you just go, okay, uh, wow, that's, that's humbling. And not to mention that, um, apparently there's, there's something here, you know, that with this music, like I should do something more with this. So did you compose the theme for ProfitCast? No. <laughs> Although I wish, cause I love that, that ending theme. <laughs> that's such a motive. That's a, that's such a motivational song or, or yeah. That music. Yeah. I wish I could take credit for that, but <laughs> So are, are you, so when it comes to who's your favorite, uh, piano playing artist? Oh gosh. Are you, so are you more of a, a Jerry Lee Lewis type bang in the keys fan or, <laughs> or, or, um, Elton John? I like way too many styles of music. Yeah. Um, like I said, pretty much the only style I don't like is country, but beyond that, I, I like just about every other style of music out there. So I, I don't enjoy playing jazz personally. Not simply because I was trained classically. Yeah. So, um, I, I, there are very few musicians that I know that can really, really rock the, the classical and the jazz. It's usually one or the other. So, um, I don't get into the jazz piano, even though I like jazz music. I just didn't, I, I, you know, I didn't learn it. I don't know. That's a good question because, you know, I, I like anything from, um, you know, an amazing classical performer to, you know, someone who knows how to just create beautiful, like I said, soundtrack music to, um, still, still to this day, one of the best, and I, I know it's old school now, but I loved Evanescence's piano. I mean, cause I love rock music yeah. that incorporates classically trained piano because it's musical. It's, it's talented. You see, you know, variation in it. Um, but man, when those guitars can get rock and it's like, yes, that's, I love rock music. If you can't tell. I, <laughs> is there, like is, is there, I wonder if there's, um, and you can educate me here a bit. So it's, there's a different approach to piano playing, obviously, when you're trying to jam in a rock band as opposed to pop and, you know, all other genres of music. You have to sort of, I would imagine, shift your style or, or, or the way you play. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, it, it really does depend on, on kind of what you're doing. Um, you know, I think what's hard is, is uh, playing in bands in the past is that a lot of the bands nowadays tend to be guitar led. Um, and a lot of pianists play block chords or synth chords, which is like, I, I just can't do it. 
It's just too simple for me. Um, I mean, I like it. So, I mean, are, you're familiar with Evanescence, right? A little bit. Okay. So if you listen to some of their songs, they do some really crazy piano stuff in there. Or um, I'm trying to think of bands that even utilize piano anymore. Um, it's just not very common. That's the thing. It comes in waves, right? Yeah, it really does. Um, I'm thinking uh, of Monsters and Men. Don't, don't they use piano? I know that's not rock, but it's more alternative. But um, I don't know. I, I think the biggest thing is, is that whatever kind of piano that is featured in the song. So it's not just block chords, but it's like there's a theme to it. There's a melody to it. Or maybe there's arpeggios going on or something that's really just quite beautiful. And you listen to it and you're just like, wow. I mean, that really complements what's going on, even if it is intense rock. That's the kind of stuff that I like to do. Um, but I think more than anything is it requires almost arranging it yourself. Like, so yeah, there's a certain style, but I think it also comes into the fact that there's, there's gotta be the ability to work with it. You know, if a guitar is trying to take over the entire song, then there's really nothing you can do. I don't know. It's, it's, it, it, it really depends. What'd you think of, uh, the eighties and the synths and the Depeche Mode era? That was fun. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I loved that stuff. Um, I, I don't personally like doing synths person. I mean, playing synths as much as, as actual, like a grand piano. Um, but I still enjoy it. I like playing the Hammond organ. That's fun. Have you ever played a pipe organ? Yeah. That was awesome. <laughs> Did you play the Phantom of the Opera theme on it? Of course. And the uh, Toccata and Fugue in D minor from Bach. Which was that one? You know, the, the, oh, that's that what one. it's called. Okay. Yeah. yeah well, the, the Phantom of the Opera is similar too, but. Yeah, I get to play that on the full. Uh, and actually, it's a uh, it's one of those organs that is pretty rare, I guess, too. So it was a full pipe organ, and the whole room was shaking. It was awesome. Have you ever been to San Diego? Mm, yeah, I have once. Yeah, it's been a long time. So we took a what we what my wife and I have been doing recently is taking the trolley because it's the best way to see the city in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. So we took the trolley in San Diego when we were there a couple of weeks ago, and there's this part of the tour where there's this pipe organ that was built into a park. And the oh, wow. guy who owned it, he said, uh, I'll, I'll sell this part to you, but you have to promise not to dismantle this pipe organ. And on top of it, you have to play it once a month. And then, wow. so, so he's, it's so funny because he's telling us this story and he's like, and every month at, uh, you know, on Saturdays or, or Sundays at 2 p.m., the organ plays and I look at my watch and it's like, 2 30 and then we we go into this like almost mini cul-de-sac like u-turn mm -hmm. uh, uh, u-shaped and at the at the pinnacle of the u is the end of the park and then you look out and down this like grassy knoll there's this girl playing the pipe organ and then there's this other woman like standing next to her like exchanging the sheet music so she can like play as she goes and literally i kid you not as we made the turn it's like <laughs> That is awesome. And I was like, well, that's a dramatic effect there, but that was pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, you know, it's, th there is something about hearing a pipe organ in person. It's, it's powerful. I mean, literally powerful too. Yeah. And do you get, to, do you, so do you play as much as you'd like to? Not right this second. No. Yeah. Um, I, I went through a little bit of a lull in music. Um, plus, unfortunately, you know, with, with anything too, you know, you go through, uh, certain seasons. Um, and I went through a situation with a band that did not end well, um, leadership decisions, stuff like that. And it, uh, it was pretty painful. Unfortunately, a lot of hurt that happened. And, um, I'm, I like playing solo, but I love playing with other musicians and that's the extrovert in me. Um, so I, I've been a little careful to get back involved with, uh, with the music group and also, um, the joy I think of music playing was taken away from that time. And so I've been kind of giving it a little bit of rest in order to bring that joy back. But the good news is, is that since podcast movement and dragon con, which obviously has been very recently, I started to have, um, a little bit more of a desire to play again. And, um, I mean like not, not just a little desire, like a passion to get back behind the piano again, start putting out some music and seeing what happens, you know, seeing how I can encourage somebody with the music or whatever. So I'm, I'm ready to start playing again. I really am. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Yeah, it's always fun to have this creative outlet, and then um, you know, once you once you have it, and you've had a taste of how much fun it is to do it, you, mm -hmm. it's always something you want to continue to nurture. And then other this other stuff comes in the way, and it, it sort of falls by the wayside. So it's, I think it's very important to to continue to bring it back, and maybe and this comes back sort of to that planning because I'm trying to do something similar. Is just set aside, even if you set aside like two hours a month, and it sounds mm -hmm. like nothing, but 
how many months have gone by that you haven't done anything with it, right? And if even yeah. if you set something aside as little as two hours to like jam a bit and to do some compositions, I'm I'm sure that you'd get a lot of enjoyment out of that. Yeah, and you know, I think too the um like you yeah there's there's the discipline side of things for sure, um and and I think to the passion side of things because. You know, I was, I was doing music, um, playing with bands and stuff, doing music that was very draining and I did it for too long. Um, and I think as a result, the joy of playing the piano just kind of went away, um, because I wasn't able to do what I love to do. And what I knew, um, was again, this goes back to what I say on ProfitCast is being the best me. There is a certain style of music that is the best me. And when I can play it, that's when I can put the passion into it. And that's when people go, wow, that was awesome. But if I can't play that style of music, then I'm not being the best of me, in which case, you know, it's just flat music. So uh, it really does go back to that whole remembering why you did it in the first place, that the passion, you know, that that was there and what drew you to it. And then setting aside that discipline time. I think it's just a reminder of how how much of a unique um, event it is when a when a band can't hold it together for an extended period of oh my time. Gosh. Yeah, <laughs> because we all we've all seen. Uh, the, the guilty pleasure of watching uh, VH1 behind the music. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and you got to think about it too. I mean, like uh, the artist mentality is uh, it's, it's very emotional and, and I'm be, being one of them. I can say this, like I am an emotional person. I am not a logical person by, by nature. Now, granted, I think logically at times, but you know, the real me that comes out is emotional. And so when you get a bunch of emotional people together, if there's a lack of maturity, <laughs> It's just a disaster waiting to happen all the time. I mean, it really is. So bands don't last long because they don't know how to work together. They don't know how to, I mean, some do obviously, but I, I think a lot of the times people don't know really how to interact with each other in a way that's healthy. So it just explodes. And when you think about when bands start, they're typically at a, at a point when there's so much other stuff going on in your lives that you're trying to get a hold of and understand. Like, I mean, it's typically like high school, right? Or sometimes yeah, even college, before yeah. then. Yeah, that's true. Well, it's interesting. I, I interviewed a lot of bands for a while being on radio. Um, and a lot of the bands that had left record labels would say, you know, when the record labels approached us, we were young and stupid and we thought, Oh, glory and fame, let's go for it. And so they would sign up with these record labels and, you know, promising you're going to get these record deals and you're going to have your albums and your music put out there and you're going to perform in front of all these people and they get out there and they have a great time. And then they realize this is not exactly what was promised. Like we own nothing. We're in debt to these record labels. Yeah. We have to work all the time. We have to create music even when we can't find the music. And it's just this, it became every, every single band that I've interviewed that's left a record label has said it was a very unhealthy part of their life. And it's sad because what they said is the same thing I just said is that it took the joy away. It took the passion away and it turned it into this, this duty. And um, <laughs> it took them years to kind of recover that. And now a lot of them have gone off on their own to do music as a passion again on their own. And it's interesting to see that though, but it does create a lot of problems or it can anyway. Did you ever see that post? It was several years ago and this is before uh, the TLC lost one of their members, but they did the anatomy of like where a record advance goes or where I think it was like they got paid. I forgot. It was maybe like half a million dollars or something like that or $300,000. And then they literally broke down every single aspect of like where that money went. And by the time it was done, I think they had like a couple of thousand dollars left. Yeah. Seriously. Well, so what's really interesting is that, you know, in order to get a signed deal, the record label will say, we'll fund everything. You don't have to worry about how to live basically while you're under our contract. And so to a, to musician, that's incredible because musicians are usually starving, right? Yeah. But what they don't realize is that they have to pay all that back. So basically you're given like a $300,000 loan and you've got to pay it all back with record sales and ticket sales at your concerts. And the only profit that you can make, unless you're an actual songwriter and get royalties from that, um, the only profit you can make is from like merchandise sales, which is why bands per, you know, really push shirts and, and hats and all that, because that's the only money that they actually keep. Yeah, and they be, be, it's almost like they become indentured servants. <laughs> it, it is so true. And I didn't know that until I was like meeting with some of these uh, these artists, you know, that were famous and they said, don't do it. I was like, what? <laughs> don't, what do you mean don't do it? Well, that's they my said, dream. don't do it. I know. I'm like, I wanted to know. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Yeah, you become a servant. I'm like, oh my gosh. But it can be good for some. So really did, you ever, did you ever have a, a, a thought, obviously with such a strong musical background into marrying that with the podcasting since you were doing it uh, on the radio anyway? 
Originally, yeah. I haven't figured out how to exactly do that yet, <laughs> to be honest. But you had an original thought to, to maybe do something or maybe even a name of a podcast in mind? Well, I really wanted to do a podcast where I would share new music with people. And again, that goes back to the radio thing. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I tried, I did try something, um, which didn't really work out, but, uh, I, I don't know. I think the, the problem with music was that I wanted to say, okay, here's a brand new song from this artist and it's awesome and I'm going to share it and here's why. Um, and here's a little bit of background, boom, play the music, but the royalties are so expensive. Oh yeah. And, and that was probably the most prohibitive reason right away. Cause I mean, it was going to be like around $300 per episode of, of royalty costs, uh, which is crazy. Because you're, you're promoting them. You're trying to help them out. You know, you know, but it is what it is. Um, so that kind of went away, even though it's still a passion and a desire I'd like to do sometime if I can figure out a way around that, you know, that cost. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of thought about could I do something about being a musician? And, and I kind of let that one go because I don't know. Again, I want to play for fun. I don't necessarily want to do a business around that. So what you decided to do instead is start ProfitCast. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about how to make money with a podcast so that I can do this stuff for, you know, I can fund my bad. Yeah, that was crazy. I don't know what So obviously there's, there's, you got to, you've, you've been able to speak to a ton of interesting folks along yeah. the journey to figuring out what it takes to make a podcast profitable. Um, and obviously I, I highly recommend people check out the series. It's, it's a lot of fun to listen to and, and, and you're definitely very engaging uh, and you make it that much more easy to listen to. But yeah. For new folks, um, I'm wondering if you could um, maybe highlight a couple of things that were sort of aha moments for you along the, the way. Um, I think you're 50 plus episodes in with that, right? Yeah, 64 60, this week. Yeah. Yep. Um, well, so, okay, so I was, the aha moments at first, I mean, there were a couple that went along the way, but um, I was doing the online radio. I knew we needed to podcast. I learned how finally to, you know, actually launch a podcast in, in, you know, in basically working with the radio station that we had. But what I didn't know how to do was how to grow an audience and how to make any money with it. And so I, I, let's see, I did two podcasts. One of the podcasts was a former radio show and one was a, a specific podcast. And both of them, I, I couldn't grow the numbers, didn't know what I was doing. Um, and I couldn't make any money with it either because I, again, I had no idea. So through that, I pod faded both of those, um, which were good decisions at the time. But then it got to the point where I said, you know, my passion is to get behind the microphone. I don't know how to make this work. I can't do radio anymore because it's a dying medium, unfortunately. So I got to get into digital media. I know podcasting is going to work, but how do I, how do I fund this so that I can pay the bills? Because as much as I love doing this, I do have to report to, you know, mortgage companies and, you know, grocery stores and the IRS, right? It, it happens. Yeah. So what do we do? And I was in the process of um, trying to create a business around this, trying to see, okay, well, could I, could I make money doing podcasting? Um, and of course I was being taught to teach, which um, you've heard on ProfitCast that I don't enjoy teaching <laughs> step-by-step stuff. Yeah. Um, I'm not that good at it. I mean, I may be good at encouraging somebody, but when it comes to a step-by-step -step teaching, that's a challenge. And, um, Sometimes people go, wow, that really helped. And most of the time people are just like, <laughs> thanks. So that's what it is. Um, but I love performing and everybody told me that, yeah, right. No one's going to get paid. To, you're not going to get paid to perform because that's like the top 1% of podcasters or whatever. So I decided to start this whole idea of, all right, well, what I'm going to do is go on this guinea pig journey of interviewing podcasters who have grown audiences, who have, uh, you know, loyal, engaged audiences, and also who have profited with their podcasts and I'm going to interview them and I'm going to do some experiments and I'm going to kind of share the journey. And I did that, started that July of 2014. Um, the concept actually started about seven or eight months prior. And so that was the idea. And I started it and I started interviewing people and the audience trickled in very slowly. It was small. <laughs> and I'm like, ah, here we go again. I don't even know what I'm doing. And um, actually it was funny because podcast movement was 2014, that is was a month and a half after I launched ProfitCast. Okay. So I'm new. I don't know what's going on. I get to podcast movement and um, I find out Daniel J. Lewis listens to it. And I'm like, wait, Daniel J. Lewis <laughs> listens to my podcast? Why? <laughs> you know? So that was pretty cool. That is cool. 
And then uh, at the time I found some other people that listened to it and I'm like, oh, wow. Okay. This is kind of surprising. Like people are listening to, how did they find my show? I don't even know. I don't even know, you know? So that was kind of cool to, to hear some of that stuff. And it gave me a little boost of confidence to realize, okay, well maybe I'm doing something right. I don't know what it is yet, but I'll figure it out. So throughout that journey, I'm interviewing all these people. And I would say it was about December of 2014 and into the, the first of this year when I started to realize I know a lot of information about podcasting because I spent six days a week for two years diving deep into how to grow and, and monetize a podcast and how to profit with one. Um, I mean, it was the most intense research I've ever done in anything. And so I realized I learned a lot more uh, that I knew a lot more than I probably should at the time because I wasn't implementing it. And so I kind of dubbed 2015 as a year of action. I have no idea how I'm going to make it work, but I got to do something with this. Um, and that's when the struggles started because in 2015, I started to get really frustrated because I'm like, I know a lot about podcasting and I'm still not growing and I'm still not making money. What's wrong with this? What's wrong with me? And so for the first six months of 2014, I was, uh, I was pretty down on myself. You heard some of those episodes where I was like, why am I doing this? And I don't even know if anyone likes the show, or if anyone's listening. Um, and then I had the last episode of profit cast, <laughs> the, 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 inf the infamous last episode. <laughs> yeah. I still get hacked about that one. Um, and it really was, it was a very serious thought that went through my head that I'm like, you know, it's been a year I've made no money with this. Um, I'm on the last few dollars of my savings account. I can't pay my bills anymore. I don't know what to do and I've got to do something or else I'm done. And, and this show's over. So I said, um, I'd love to keep this going, but I don't know if it has any value anymore. And, and maybe I've said everything I need to say. So that was what that episode was all about. It was an exploration of that because people had said, you need to teach. You need to teach. That's the only thing you're going to do. You're never going to make money performing. So just go teach. You don't have enough numbers to, to get a, a major sponsor because they're looking for big numbers. So you might make, you know, a little bit of money here and there, but don't even try that. Just go teach, put out a product, put out a course, whatever. And, um, I know every, let me just tell you right now, Harry, I know everything there is to know about how to put a course together, how to put out a product, how to, to create a sales funnel. I just couldn't figure out how to do it for me because I didn't know what to talk about, but I could coach you on how to do it right now. Cause I know so much about it. It's ridiculous, but I just went, I don't want to teach. I can't imagine myself doing this the rest of my life. And, um, so somebody finally was talking to me. I was talking to my uh, physical therapist and I know you've heard this story, so I'll, I'll try to change it up a little bit. I don't want it to be the exact same. Um, he and I, uh, well, so you know this story, but I'll, I'll for the benefit for the benefit of our listeners. Yeah, I'll tell you, listeners. I I uh, ruptured my disc, my lower disc in my back, in uh, right around Christmas of 2013. Let me just tell you that I've never experienced so much pain in my life. Nerve pain. There is nothing like it. Everything else is nothing. <laughs> so I literally was in level 20 out of 10 pain for three weeks straight. And, um, I seriously thought it my heart was going to not, I'm not kidding. I thought I was going to have a heart attack because the pain was so bad. Um, and I'm young. So <laughs> I'm like, this is not good. I uh, 24 hours a day, horrible. So that got taken care of, but in the surgery process, something happened where the entire sciatic nerve that goes all the way down your posterior, you know, all the way down your leg and into your heel, yeah. um, is completely numb still a year and a half later, almost well, I'm coming up on two years now. Um, completely numb. As a result, the brain it doesn't send signals down to some of the muscles. So I walked with a limp. Couldn't actually walk for the first six months without like a walking stick or something. Um, that scared the crap out of me. Let me just tell you right now, because because I'm very mobile, and that really I was scared I was never going to walk again. Um, so through that, I was seeing a physical therapist to see if that could be fixed, and I started Pilates, which is amazing, by the way. I, thought Pilates was for girls. Not exactly. Um, that's an amazing little thing. So anyway, talking with my physical therapist over a year, he's like, we're going to start a podcast. We're going to start a podcast. We need to start a podcast. And I'm thinking like, great, great, great. Go for it. Whatever. Um, I want to say it was in um, March or April. He was asking me how the consulting was going. And at the time, nah, it wasn't going well. I'm like, I cannot get clients for the life of me. Uh, apparently they know I don't teach well. <laughs> so, <laughs> word, word got out. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Although I have one client that, that I, I, I shut off um, consulting a while back, but I've stayed with one client because 
I actually am helping him and it's going really well and he's doing awesome. So that's been fantastic. But he said, well, if you don't want to consult or teach, what do you want to do? And I said, dude, if I could get paid to perform, that's what I want to do. And he said, well, do you know of anyone that's doing that? And I said, yeah, he's reach out to them. So I reached out to them and I asked them and, and, and the irony was they didn't really know how they succeeded getting paid to perform either. Um, which I was like, okay, so you lucked into it. Uh, and I asked a bunch of people on this and I won't mention names cause those guys are awesome. Um, but it was weird. So I thought, well, I guess I'm on my own on this one. Like, I don't know who to ask. I don't know who to find out from. Um, but at the time I'm like, I still don't know how I'm going to make money with this. I don't know what to do. And I had built up a relationship with, um, audiobooks.com because I did that episode about our sponsorships really worth it. And so I was contacting a bunch of companies and asking about what their requirements for sponsorships are because, you know, everybody asks, how do you get a sponsor? And I was trying to show people that um, it's an interesting process to get a sponsor. So I talked about that. But then later, this guy, Nick from Audiobooks, calls me up and he goes, you know, can I talk to you about um, starting a podcast? And I'm thinking like, all right, that's fine. We chat. And his whole thing was basically asking the ins and outs and the nuts and bolts. Um, But then I said... Uh, basically the conversation was over and he said, okay, well, thanks for your time. Really appreciate it. And he says, well, one more thing. Here's the thing. We we don't want to host it. Um, We want somebody else to do it. And the funny part was that the week before I had received five or six phone calls from different friends who did not talk to each other, had no idea that I was trying to figure out how to get paid to perform. And each and every one of them said, Hey man, I just had this crazy thought. What if you were to like, you know, host a podcast for a company or an entrepreneur or whatever and have them pay you to do it. And after the fifth call or sixth call or whatever, I'm like, okay, okay. I get the message like, yeah, but I don't know how. And so then when Nick said, here's the thing, we're looking for somebody to host it for us. I thought you've got to be freaking kidding me. (laughs) Well, yeah, I mean, it's, and obviously people are going to say that you were lucky, but we we all know that that's when preparation meets opportunity, right? Yeah. I'm going to call it, um, somewhat of a miracle slash luck slash perseverance, preparation. Yeah. All that. it was, it was a multitude of things because this is something that I've been trying to do for years. So it's not like it was a, Oh wow, that was lucky. Um, and I'd built this relationship with audiobooks, never expecting anything out of it. Yeah. So it's not like he just randomly called me out of the yellow pages. Like he, he knew to call me because of the relationship we had built, which that's something else I learned from that. Like, Oh wow. So relationships, you never know what's going to come from them. So that was cool. Yeah, there's so many nuggets in there. I mean, just the fact that you persevered and by doing the right thing, like you said, by helping Audible, um, I'm sorry, audiobooks.com with the, their questions that they had, they naturally felt that you were a subject matter expert that they could talk to uh, when they wanted to run some ideas by you, and they did that. Okay. But then you've been building all this goodwill through your podcast and establishing tons of relationships, I'm sure, um, by through people you've interviewed, through people you've interacted with, people that have contacted you about the show. And so all that literally led up to this moment where you were ready. You were ready for this opportunity when it showed up and you were able to hit it out of the park. You know, that's a really good point to bring up right there uh, because you're right, I was ready then. And if if I had been offered that three months prior, I would not have been ready. And that's something that I've recently discovered when it comes to profiting with a podcast or growing a podcast is that your mindset is 80% absolutely critical. And a lot of people blow off mindset. In fact, I've talked about mindset on ProfitCast and most people are like, you're just talking about fluff. You're not giving me the nuts and bolts and the step by step. And it wasn't until recently that I go, if you don't get the mindset down, these nuts and bolts step by step will do you nothing. You will fail. And, um, and, and I would have failed because my mindset was not right. I can guarantee I would have failed three months ago. The nuts and bolts are all over the internet. Go, I mean, there's yeah. hundreds of YouTube videos on how to do all this stuff. You know, that, we, we, there's a over a saturation of that stuff. And like you said, you, yeah. you, can't, you can't just show that to people and expect that they're going to succeed because 99 times out of 100, they're not. Like, and, and your point is spot on. Without the mindset um, and, and the will to persevere in the face of tons and tons of, um, you know, headwinds, it's, it's, yeah. it takes a, a unique skill set and mindset to get through that. 
Well, and you know, like I said, I, I told you that I could teach you everything about putting out a product and a course and, and the right sales funnel. Um, I mean, it's a half joke, half seriousness, like I really could. And that's, that's an example right there where I learned all the nuts and bolts on how to make millions of dollars with a podcast or on the internet. But I personally could not make that work because my mindset isn't there for that. So regardless of how true that is, I would fail at that. And I appreciate the, the fact that you're honest ab- about how you, you said yourself that you're not good at teaching and you didn't sort of force it and say, well, I'm just going to follow the herd and I'm going to teach because everyone else is teaching. I'm going to put together this course because everyone else is putting a course and I'll just take people's money because I've got, you know, you've got your name built up and people, I'm sure people would buy your course just based on um, your history profit cast and, yeah. and, and listening to you week in, week out that they're like, oh, if, if Brian's been out of course, then it, it must be good. And, and honestly, Harry, that's why I didn't put out a course. Uh, that's exactly the reason right there, because I, I was told, well, people will buy because you, you've got this knowledge. And I said, yeah, but what if I don't deliver them value? Yeah. And I know I couldn't because of my, again, I'm not a teacher, right? Uh, now, if I partnered with the teacher, that'd be a totally different story. But because I wasn't at the time, I'm like, I, I'm not, I'm not comfortable selling something to somebody for them to come back later and go, I didn't get anything out of that. I'm like, that's ridiculous. Why, why would I do that? So, Yeah. <laughs> I can't do that to people. Was that you slamming your hand down on the table? No, <laughs> that was me going, uh, <laughs> well, I know what happens. I know what happens and I don't agree with it. Well, actually I think that was an awesome exclamation point <laughs> to, to your whole story, which I think is amazing. And, uh, I know you got to run in a bit. So, yeah. um, you want to give folks the rundown of, of, of the podcast you're currently hosting now? Sure. Um, well, so the, the podcast chronologically was uh, Aero Squad came first. And uh, that was our, that is our, our, our fan-based podcast for the TV show Arrow, which um, if you're a comic book fan, it's all about the Green Arrow from the comics. And we have a blast doing that. I have two phenomenal, freaking amazing co-hosts that um, I finally, I mentioned this, got to meet at Dragon Con for the first time. Um, I love those guys. We have so much fun together. And that's an interesting story, which we won't go into about, you know, how do we monetize that podcast Yeah. or do we keep it as a passion and, you know, just cover the costs. And, and so that's been an interesting journey, but, um, really have loved working with those two. And, uh, I, oh, that's another one. I almost threw in the towel on that podcast <laughs> almost because I was in a bad state of mind, uh, and, and a hard place, you know? And if I had thrown in the towel on that, I would have missed out on basically the last couple of episodes that I shared on ProfitCast about, you know, hearing from your community and understanding the impact that you can have as a podcaster. Um, I talk about that and I would have missed out on all that. Oh my gosh, that would have been the stupidest decision in the world. So I'm so glad I, I smacked myself first. And then there's Profit. Oh, so that's aerosquad.com. Um, ProfitCast, obviously you know what that's about. Uh, that's ProfitCastUniverse.com. And then... Um, audiobooks.com podcast and audiobooks.com or audiobooks.com slash podcast, depending on how you want to find it. But that's with uh, Addy Sacido. She and I are, uh, are co-hosting that one. And that's been fun. That's new. And um, so, you know, we're still trying to find our rhythm and tweaking things, but uh, we're having a blast doing that and getting to interview some great people. And we get to listen to books, man, and talk about them. How cool is that? Yeah. You recently had Pat Flynn on. Yeah. We've got some other cool authors coming up too. So Get excited. I, I heard. I've been trying to squeeze the names out of Addie, but she's mom. <laughs> I know. And I, I want to say one right now that I'm really excited about. Uh, gosh, UFC. But I'm going to. We'll, we'll go from there. Anyway. Um, and then uh, we just launched Podcasters Paradise podcast with uh, John Lee Dumas. And uh, that that launched, gosh, what was it? Uh, September 14th. So that's brand new. Got a bunch of stuff going on with that. I'm excited for that one, too. That's been a really exciting. I, I've already had many interviews with that one. Um, and being able to really dive into these people's stories has been just a treat in of itself. So if no one else listens to that podcast, I'm getting a lot out of it as the host. <laughs> so having a blast. And then working on some new ones. Well, you, yes. def- you definitely sound like a, a busy, busy man. And, but most importantly, you sound like you're having a blast doing it. I love every day of the week. <laughs> Seriously, it's so I, much fun. I, I think, Brian, your enthusiasm is so contagious. And, and the first time I heard your show, I was like, can this guy keep this up? Really? Really? And then <laughs> I, I kept listening. I kept listening. And he's like, I mean, is he really going to keep rocking it every single episode? And <laughs> Dude, you've heard those episodes where I was like, Let's, uh, I don't know if I can rock it. <laughs> I'm quitting. This is over. Oh, man. No, this but- has not been an easy journey. I'll tell you that. But um, 
it's been it's been rewarding. So uh, one one uh, one fun question, and then we'll wrap it up. When was the last time you laughed out loud? Uh, today, right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing it right now. I, I try to laugh out loud every single day. I really do. Um, and that's something that I, I was reminded at a Dragon Con is I think we laughed pretty much the entire weekend. Um, 24 hours. Well, not, not quite. Uh, it was, I laughed so hard though. What, okay. So let me share this quick story and then, and then we'll go. I had a goal to make my co-host Emily cry. Okay. And, uh, I don't, because she doesn't cry, right? She's tough. So we were joking around. I'm like, I'm going to make you cry at Dragon Con. And everyone's like, whatever. Well, how are you going to make her cry? And I said, I, w- I reserve that for the moment that she cries. I could hurt her or I could make her laugh and cry, <laughs> whatever, you know? So that was kind of the joke. Well, Saturday, so this was Friday through Sunday and Saturday night, um, I made her laugh so hard. She was crying and her makeup was running everywhere. I'm like, yes, <laughs> did it. And then the next night, um, I think it was Emily actually that, that made me cry, but also my other coast, Kevin, pretty sure he was crying too. He, he was silent and I've never seen him laugh like that ever or heard him laugh either. So, I mean, it's those moments that you just go, man, the power of laughter is absolutely phenomenal. And, um, you know, I'd been dealing with, uh, obviously, as you know, the physical stuff and, and I've had, uh, you know, just a lot of struggles trying to do that and then uh, trying, trying to get my strength back. And, and I am walking again almost. There's almost no limp anymore, by the way. Um, but, you know, I, I was interesting is the more I laughed, the better my body healed. It was weird. No, it's so, not weird. that's not weird at all. Man. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. So laughter is, uh, is a daily thing for me now. And it's, it is indeed the best medicine. Yeah, it's incredible. Well, buddy, I'm so happy we were able to do this, man. I, I know uh, <laughs> we're trying to coordinate schedules at the last moment, but um, I'm happy we got to meet in person. I'm happy uh, yeah. we're, we're podcasting buddies, and I'm looking forward to the next time we get to meet and uh, geek out on all things podcast, sports, music, all sorts of stuff like that. Totally. Likewise. And I'm going to continue rocking your shirt, man, because uh, I <laughs> you, love that shirt. And dude, I got, I got pictures with, with famous actors in your, in your shirt. So I know you wear that well, man. <laughs> been, support. Yeah. I've been truly humbled by the folks that have been picked up the shirt from uh, the, the conference and, and continue to wear it. I caught a lot of folks wore it home actually. And I was really, really yeah. humbled by that. That's awesome, man. I'm so glad you did that. All right, Brian, take care. And I hope uh, you're on the fast road to recovery. Uh, best of luck. And is there a Twitter? You are I am the real Brian. I am the real Brian. Yep. Feel free to join me there. It'd be great. Yeah. So thanks again to Brian for that revealing interview and engaging and fun. And at all times when it comes to anything, Brian, the real Brian related, full of entertaining, high energy and it's really infectious because every time I get I, I meet Brian or I talk to him, he just brings a, a, a huge smile to my face. And I think that comes through, and I think it came through on this interview uh, today. And I hope you get a chance to check out one of his many shows. I'm really happy with his success, and um, I'm really wishing him the best. So check out the show notes on podcastjunkies.com slash 57. And... I've got some uh, reviews to read out. I think it's been a while since I've gone through these. So I may actually repeat something that uh, I've read before. And if I do, then you'll keep me honest. And if um, otherwise, some folks will get some double credit for their iTunes review. So we'll go back to a couple we received earlier this summer. One was from Liz Covart from um, uh, Benjamin Franklin's World. And it says, if you listen to podcasts, you will love podcast junkies. Thank you, Liz. I get uh, a couple of reviews from App Critic 8 and User Bots. Uh, excellent way to get into podcasting. And if you're a true podcast junkies, this is the show to listen in on. Don't take my word for it, people. Listen to User Bots. <laughs> Story Corey says the host has a nice, calm presentation that keeps a soothing aesthetic to encase excellent interviews. I like the sound of that. Richard Rad says this show is solid, warm personality, interesting guests. The conversations lift the curtain on the world of podcasting. Organized Mindfully says, what a great podcast. I find myself having to limit how many podcasts I can subscribe to. And this podcast helps give me an overview of who's out there right now rocking the podcast world. Shari T says, quite simply, junkie, loving this, smiley face emoticon. Thanks, Shari. 
for those of you who've been listening for the last couple of episodes, you'll notice that I've been promoting the Patreon page. It's at patreon.com slash podcast junkies. And I'd like to thank Steve Walter, who personally uh, started making a ongoing donation to the show. Thank you so much, Steve. That is incredibly, incredibly appreciated. Um, and I'm really honored that you uh, find it found the time um, and the desire to, to help out the show. Again, folks, every little bit counts. So shout out to Steve. Thanks so much. Um, and to Mike Vardy as well, who's also an ongoing contributor. Thank you, you guys. Uh, I truly appreciate it. And it's something that I'm looking to continue to build. Again, every little bit helps the show because it's completely self-funded. And there's a lot of interesting things I'd like to do with the show as it grows. And I I, I'll have the ability to do that through the Patreon page um, if you guys uh, are so inclined. So again, if you want to have your interview read on, I'm sorry, not your interview, that if you want to have your uh, your review, sorry, brain freeze right now, your review read on the show, um, as I just did with all the fantastic folks that continue to support the show, then go ahead, go to podcastjunkies.com slash iTunes. And there you can subscribe, rate, and review. All three components of that are just as important. Subscriptions, obviously important. Rating, five stars, down to one star, whatever it is you feel it in your heart to do. Uh, and the review is actually important because sometimes um, people just want to click five stars really quickly and say, great show. But I'd rather have uh, fewer interviews from people who have taken the time to listen to the show and are passionate about it and have something genuine to say than hundreds or thousands of reviews from people who simply felt like it's something uh, they had to do without even listening to the show. Not that I think any of my fans would do that, so that doesn't seem to be an issue. If you'd like to receive a, a free PDF on how I'm more productive with the show, uh, you can now do that by text message. Just simply while you're here, mobile listening to the phone, send a quick tech mes text message to 33444 with the word podcast junkies, all one word. You'll be prompted to enter in your email and I'll get that off to you right away. As always, you can sign up for that on the site as well, but sometimes people are not at their home computers and this is an easy way to do that. Text 33444 to pod uh, and with the word podcast junkies and some uh, text message uh, PDF email sign up magic will make its way towards you okay guys thanks again for listening to the show um, I'm really excited um, we've got some interesting guests coming up I got Jared Morris on on deck for from um, Rainmaker FM and uh, the host of several amazing podcasts including the lead and showrunner and I'm really excited to talk to him. He should be queued up next, um, but I've got a couple of other interesting folks that I'm working on as well. So um, that uh, Jared comes to mind immediately. So stay tuned and, and continue to listen. And if you're subscribing, you'll see these automatically pop up. If not, shame on you. And just in case you thought I forgot <laughs> the retention uh, hashtag for this episode, Given that uh, Brian is super enthusiastic with the intros for his podcasts and he's known to say, let's rock it, um, we're going to do Brian Rocks It as the hashtag. So hashtag Brian Rocks It, one word, B-R-I-A-N-R-O-C-K-S-I-T with a hashtag. That's, uh, that's how you let me know You'll, you've been listening all the way to the end of this. High five. See you soon.